How can horror audiences find pleasure in what by nature is distressful and unpleasant? This conundrum, which has been dubbed the paradox of horror, or alternatively, the paradox of tragedy, has long puzzled psychologists, philosophers, and horror fans alike, resulting in hundreds of theories as to what exactly the appeal of horror is and how it could even be possible for people to enjoy it. In fact, this literary paradox is so old that one of the first scholars to ponder this question was Aristotle way back around 330 BCE. In his theory of catharsis, he postulated that the reason why people enjoy Greek tragedies was essentially that by experiencing these negative emotions, they would then be able to release some sort of inner tension, which would purge such emotions from oneself. So it wasn't that he thought these emotions are in themselves pleasurable, but that through experiencing them, and thus, in his opinion, expelling them, the resulting effect was a desirable enough result to cause people to put themselves through the discomfort of experiencing them in the first place. This theory, like many others on this subject, can be categorized as compensatory, meaning basically that whatever perceived benefit one gets out of consuming such content is enough to compensate for the unpleasant experience itself. However, in spite of this theory's possible intuitive appeal, many criticisms have been levied against it. For example, to paraphrase Ned Hedinger, scary movies don't make scared people less afraid. You're never gonna hear someone say, I'm scared, so I'm gonna go watch a horror movie to get rid of my fear. And additionally, most horror content is designed to leave a lingering sense of fear in its audience, which is completely opposite to the idea that such content would lessen our fear. And finally, if what was pleasurable was the dissipation of the emotion as a result of experiencing it during a horror movie, we would only enjoy the end of the movie instead of enjoying the movie throughout as those who like horror typically do. Now, unfortunately, in the interest of saving time, I won't be able to talk about or go as in depth on each theory as I might like to. So I'll first give a quick overview of some of the less well-known ideas on the appeal of horror, and then talk in more detail about the famous theories. Beginning with excitation transfer theory. This hypothesis is actually sort of a continuation of Aristotle's catharsis theory. Coined by Dr. Dolph Zellman in 1980, excitation transfer is a theory which suggests that, to, that the suspense one feels whilst watching a horror movie builds up until the conflict or threat in the film is positively resolved. At which point the built up fear is transformed into a positive emotion, for example, relief or elation. Our next theory is called conversion. First proposed by famed Enlightenment scholar David Hume in 1757, Hume's theory, similar to the previous ones, involves a transformation of negative emotions into positive ones. However, where Hume's idea differs is what he thought caused this transformation. Unlike Aristotle, it wasn't the purging of negative emotions, and it wasn't Zillman's suggestion of conflict resolution. Rather, Hume was of the opinion that if a tragedy was well-crafted, the positive emotions one would experience from said tragedy would be a result of appreciation for its artistic presentation or quality. Now, at roughly the same time as Hume, another 18th century intellectual named Jean-Baptiste Dubot, also known as La Belle Dubot, was pondering the same question as to why people enjoyed tragedies. However, the conclusion Dubot came to is quite different from all the previous theories we explored. Dubois was of the opinion that ennui, or simply boredom, was the reason for the popularity of tragedy. Dubois believed that people are naturally predisposed to a powerful kind of boredom and listlessness, and that feeling such a way was the quote-unquote most disagreeable state that one could be in. So much so that people would much rather experience negative emotions than nothing at all. All right, so this next theory isn't exactly niche, but it is personally less compelling to me than some of the more notable ideas to be discussed shortly. Proposed by the infamous Sigmund Freud in 1919, Freud theorized that the human psyche consisted of three parts, the impulsive id, the conscious ego, and the moral superego. He believed that horror appeals to the repressed childhood fears and forbidden desires of the primitive id, and that such fears and desires are normally suppressed by the ego and societal norms. Or more simply, 
Horror gives one the ability to explore these forbidden or repressed ideas, but in a way that brings no real harm to oneself or others. The final niche theory I want to present is benign masochism. First coined by Rosamund Schiller in 1980, although it may sound scandalous, this theory is really anything but. For example, enjoying spicy food or sad music could both be categorized as benign masochism. To quote Paul Rosen et al., benign masochism refers to enjoying initially negative experiences that the brain falsely interprets as threatening. This realization that the brain has been fooled and that there is no real danger leads to pleasure derived from mind over body. And thus concludes our quick overview. Now since we've covered those, we can now get to the real heart of the matter, starting with easily the most researched, most common, and most well-known theory on the appeal of horror, sensation seeking. This is a personality trait first defined by Marvin Zuckerman in his 1979 book, Sensation Seeking Beyond the Optimal Level of Arousal. According to Zuckerman, sensation seeking refers to the seeking of varied, novel, complex, and intense sensations and experiences, and the willingness to take physical, social, legal, and financial risks for the sake of such experiences." Unquote. Zuckerman proposed that there are four main components of sensation seeking. The first being thrill and adventure seeking, which is the desire to engage in exciting or risky activities, for example, skydiving, high-speed driving, scuba diving, etc. The second component is experience seeking. This refers to the desire for new and unusual sensory or mental experiences. And people with this trait are drawn to a variety of experiences that are unique rather than dangerous. The third component is disinhibition. People with strong tendencies towards disinhibition are characterized by a preference for immediate gratification, impulsive behavior, lack of restraint, and disregard for so, uh, social conventions. For example, you may have heard, when people drink, they lose all their inhibitions. This means that they have become disinhibited. And the fourth and final component is boredom susceptibility. This trait is pretty cut and dry. It's basically just your ability to tolerate a lack of stimulation. A common sign of boredom susceptibility is dislike for repetition. For example, routine work tasks, the same song too many times in a row, driving to work, etc. But now that you know what sensation seeking is, let's talk about how it's related to horror enjoyment. As I stated earlier, previous studies on the psychology of horror fans have focused heavily on sensation seeking. And a large portion of these studies have demonstrated that high sensation seeking correlates with and may even predict horror preference in individuals. Some such studies include Zuckerman 1983, Cantor and Sparks, 1984, Edwards, 1984, Gunter, 1985, etc., etc. You get the idea. With the general consensus between these researchers being that sensation seeking individuals may just have a preference for media which is intense, stimulating, and exciting, regardless of if the media itself is negative or positive, hence, horror preference. But before we move on, I just want to give a quick rundown on what exactly the physical experience that sensation seekers may enjoy is, and how that works in the body. Now obviously you all know what an adrenaline rush is, but what you might not know is how it works. It starts firstly with your brain perceiving a threat, and within milliseconds before you even process this threat, it triggers your amygdala, the fear center of the brain. After that, the amygdala alarms your hypothalamus, which is a hormone controller. And in turn, the hypothalamus activates your adrenal glands, which immediately start releasing adrenaline. This is the fight or flight hormone. This hormone causes a plethora of physical reactions, such as tachycardia, increased blood pressure, reduced digestion, muscle tension, and many more. For many sensation seekers, this can be an enjoyable experience, for the pure fact that it's very stimulating. And the subsetting of adrenaline can also be quite pleasant due to the relief one feels afterwards. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's it, we've solved it, that's the appeal of horror, but I'm afraid it's never that simple. And there's actually several criticisms and inconsistencies with this hypothesis. For starters, sample sizes used are often small, and a fair amount of other researchers have actually found no positive correlation between sensation seeking and horror preference. 
And of those that did find a correlation, it was often a small one. An additional criticism is that many of these researchers use diverse methods, which may sound good, but it actually makes it really difficult to compare results and come to any real conclusions. So while I definitely would not discount sensation seeking, and I do personally believe it's a strong predictor of horror preference, I think it would be incorrect to state that it's the only factor. But moving on, the next popular theory on the appeal of horror is morbid curiosity. Morbid curiosity is interest in anything that relates to death or is potentially dangerous, and it may be a significant factor in horror's appeal. Here's how. Firstly, some research has found that individuals with high levels of morbid curiosity are more likely to watch horror films, more likely to watch them alone, and less likely to be scared after watching them. To quote Haiyan Yang, the primary uh, hypothesis as to why this is the case is that as an inherently curious species, many of us are fascinated by what our own kind is capable of, and observing storylines in which actors must confront the worst parts of themselves serves as a pseudo-character study of the darkest parts of the human condition. So essentially, horror allows people to safely grapple with the dark side of humanity and explore the nature of evil. Personally, I think that this is pretty compelling, and it's definitely one of the reasons that I enjoy horror myself. And it may actually have influenced my decision to pursue funeral direction and mortuary science post high school. However, just as with the previous theory, I do not think that morbid curiosity accounts entirely for why people enjoy horror. But if you're interested to, to know more about morbid curiosity and want to know where you land, look up the morbid curiosity test by Colton Scribner, who's a behavioral scientist at the Recreational Fear Lab in Denmark and member of the psychology department at Arizona State University. But moving on, it's time to discuss threat simulation. This theory posits that one potential reason why people may watch horror is that it can act as a sort of scary play with which people can safely, psychologically prepare themselves for adversity and catastrophes. This is done by imagining themselves in the place of the victims or main characters of a horror story, and thus mentally simulating the experience and working out what they would do in such a situation. A great example of this is in 2021, when Scribner et al. conducted a survey on the mental states of horror fans and non-horror fans during the COVID-19 pandemic. And what they found was that horror fans reported less psychological distress than non-fans. The proposed explanation for this phenomenon is that exposure to catastrophic events through horror had aided fans in learning effective coping mechanisms which helped them to be more psychologically resilient to real-world catastrophes. So not only is threat simulation a potential allure of horror, it may also be a benefit of horror consumption. Okay, now this next theory comes from distinguished philosophy professor Barris Gott, and it flips almost everything else I've talked about on its head. The basic idea is that there is no paradox of horror, simply because it's not paradoxical to enjoy negative emotions. Now I have to preface, we're about to get really abstract, so stick with me. To understand this theory, you're going to need to unlearn one of the most basic assumptions everyone makes, which is that emotions and feelings are the same thing. In God's philosophy, these are two different things. So for example, quote unquote negative emotions, such as fear, anger, sadness, etc., do not always result in negative feelings, such as unpleasantness or pain. But how is this the case? Well, according to Gott, emotional processes can be broken down into three main uh, components. The object of the emotion, the evaluation of the object, and the resulting feeling plus emotion. The process goes like this. Imagine that you're afraid because you were in a car accident. The object of your emotion is being in an accident, and the evaluation is that it is bad or threatening to be in an accident. This results in unpleasant fear. However, an alternative example is, imagine you're afraid because you're on a roller coaster. The object of your fear is being on a roller coaster, but in this case, the evaluation is that it is good or exciting to be on a roller coaster. This results in pleasant fear. So the resulting emotion is the same, but the feeling is different. So in essence, God's theory tells us that 
emotions aren't always good or bad by themselves, it's about how we judge the situation. And that's why sometimes even scary things can feel good. Once again, this might sound pretty compelling, but there are some significant inconsistencies with this theory. For example, the most common criticism is that this idea doesn't work for all emotions. Let's take grief as an example. If someone felt pleasure at the death of a loved one, then we would not say that they are experiencing grief. So in that way, grief is a inherently unpleasant emotion. But it's not just grief. Another common example could be disappointment. In this case, if someone enjoyed their expectations not being met, then we would never say that they're experiencing disappointment. This inconsistency totally contradicts Scott's opinion that emotions and feelings are separate from one another. But, to play devil's advocate for a moment, I think that this might not be a fair comparison. Because if we're to assume that God is correct, then I think his theory would only be able to apply to the overarching base emotions, such as fear, anger, sadness, etc. And that emotions like grief and disappointment are too specific to work with his idea. In my opinion, this is because the objects of emotions, such as grief and disappointment, are predetermined. For example, if we think of sadness, the object of this emotion could really be anything. But if we, when we talk about grief, which is a subset of sadness, the object of this emotion must always involve the loss of something. Similarly, the object of disappointment is also predetermined because, um, sorry, is also predetermined and must always involve unmet desired expectations. Now, I'm not trying to say that I agree with God. In fact, I actually have really mixed opinions on his theory and I'm personally leaning towards him being wrong. But I don't want any of you to immediately discount something based purely on a single criticism. So let's all remember to consider things in a nuanced way. Now, before I move on to different topics, we're finally at the last theory on the appeal of horror, which is social relevance and the reflection of societal fears in horror media. According to film philosophers, social relevance in the context of horror is about how horror stories, whether in movies, books, or games, can tap into real world issues. For example, racism, corruption, plague, etc. These are all real world issues that have been touched upon by horror at one point or another. And in fact, some researchers have found that when cultural unrest is high, horror movies see a surge in viewing. Some theorize that this is due to the fictional or fantastical nature of horror, which allows us to approach and digest these topics more easily. For example, to quote Heather Fiveson, horror movies lure the audience with fantasy while reflecting society's fears and concerns. The trappings of fantasy make these uncomfortable and challenging topics palatable and command enjoyment from the audience through the fear and anxiety inducing media. There are many different examples of such quote unquote societal fears being explored through horror, but in the interest of time management, I'll just mention one. During the COVID-19 pandemic, horror movies about viruses and other illnesses gained a sudden increase in viewership. And specifically, the movie Contagion, which at the time was already a decade old film, began trending on all streaming services. As mentioned previously, this is thought to be a result of people wanting to explore socially relevant or contentious subjects, but in a more comfortable or consumable way. Ergo, fictional entertainment. Okay. Now, I'm gonna let you guys process everything for a moment because I know this whole section on horror appeal has been pretty extensive. So if you're having a hard time keeping up or taking notes for an LOL, just as a reminder, so far we have discussed the paradox of horror with an overview on horror appeal theories such as catharsis, excitation transfer, conversion, relief from boredom, the primitive id, and benign masochism with a second, more detailed section on sensation-seeking, morbid curiosity, threat simulation, rejection of the paradox of horror, and social relevance. Okay, now that we have that over with, I'm hoping we've all sufficiently caught our breath and are ready to move on to traits of horror fans and factors which affect horror preference. 
When doing research on this subject, I quickly realized that there were four main factors researchers had identified which affect for a preference. These four factors are age, gender, personality, and psychological protective framework. Beginning with the simplest factor, age. This is really cut and dry, with the general consensus amongst researchers being that horror is most popular with adolescent individuals and decreases in popularity with age. One explanation for why this is the case actually brings us back to sensation seeking, because researchers theorize that because the, the personality trait of sensation seeking de uh, decreases with age, this also translates to a decrease in horror preference with age. Moving on, our next factor to consider is gender. Believe it or not, gender compared to all other demographic and individual characteristics is the most consistent predictor of horror preference. No other trait has been identified to affect horror preference as much as gender has, with the consensus amongst researchers being that, on average, men and, uh, men and boys seek out, enjoy, and are less frightened by horror and violent media than women and girls. This conclusion is consistent but the theories as to why this is the case sometimes differ. The two primary explanations for this trend are gender socialization theory and disgust sensitivity. To boil it down, gender socialization theory is the idea that in studies where participants self-reported their fear levels when consuming horror media, men were more likely to report lesser fear than women because of historically instilled social standards pressuring them to downplay their fear in order to appear more macho or manly. Researchers believe that this could be a conscious or subconscious phenomenon. The next prominent hypothesis is disgust sensitivity. To quote Martin Neal, one possible explanation for women's reaction to horror may be their disgust sensitivity. Women in general report greater disgust, disgust sensitivity than do men, with disgust being a protective response to a direct threat to survival, such as contamination, lesions, sores, or disease. It's unclear why exactly women are more prone to disgust sensitivity, but it does seem to have some level of effect on horror popularity amongst women. Now moving on, our third factor, personality. We've already covered a little bit about personality traits in horror when discussing sensation seeking. However, in addition to that, many other personality traits have been studied in relation to horror. But before I say anything about those, I want to preface that I will not be going in depth on this subject whatsoever. Because the literature on it has been limited in both number and scope, often with different studies coming to conflicting results. This makes it very challenging to reach any actual conclusions. So instead, here's just a quick rundown on some interesting findings. Out of three studies, two found a, a correlation between low agreeableness and horror preference, but one found no correlation. In a study by Jonathan Norman, researchers found no relationship between any personality traits and horror preference, and instead demonstrated that loneliness and gender were most predictive of preference. Additionally, Many studies which found a link between sensation seeking and horror also found a link between low neuroticism and horror preference. And lastly, several studies have randomly found some personality traits such as Machiavellianism and psychoticism to correlate with horror preference. But just as I stated previously, none of these findings have been very consistent with one another and are therefore, in my opinion, not very compelling. All right, now the final component to discuss is psychological protective framework, um, which I'm gonna let you know right now, many researchers believe that without a protective framework, one cannot enjoy horror. And I also personally think that this factor is very important to horror enjoyment. But what is a psychological protective frame? Well, let's break it down. There are three main types, safety, detachment, and control. A safety frame essentially means that we have to believe we are physically safe and that one cannot enjoy horror if they don't actually feel safe. The next framework is detachment. This is the ability to psychologically distance oneself from horror content. For example, if you watched a disturbing horror movie, 
Uh, you could detach yourself by remembering that it's just actors and none of it is real. And the last framework is control, which basically means that you have to feel that you're in, in control of whatever content you're consuming. For example, being able to pause, take a break, turn it off, etc. Now, before I move on, I'd like to give just one example of what can happen if someone lacks one of these protective frameworks. But first, trigger warning for graphic descriptions of mutilation. In 1994, Kate McCauley and Rosen conducted a psychological study to determine why college students would choose to watch violent horror movies more than violent documentaries. They did this by exposing students to three short documentary videos of real life horrors. One clip showed cows being stunned, killed, and butchered in a slaughterhouse. A second clip pictured a live monkey being struck in the head with a hammer, having its skull cracked open and its brain served as dessert. And a third clip depicted a child's facial skin being turned inside out in preparation for surgery. Of the, of the participants, 90% turned off the videos before reaching the end. And of those that did finish all of them, they also reported feeling highly disturbed by the documentaries. However, these same students were barely phased by horror films of comparable carnage. The proposed explanation for this phenomenon is that because the documentaries were real events, um, the students were unable to psychologically detach themselves from it and were thus highly disturbed by the content. To me, this is a clear example of the necessity of psychological protective frameworks in order to enjoy horror media. And on that cheery note, it's finally time for me to share my products with you guys. But before I do that, I would first like to close out this whole section by taking a moment to ask, if you enjoy horror, or have enjoyed it before, please raise your hand. Okay, now look around. <laughs> Throughout this presentation, you may have been thinking, what's the point of all this psychology stuff? This has nothing to do with me. But you're wrong. This has everything to do with you. If your hand was raised, then every single thing I've said up till now has been about you, and about me. <laughs> It's about understanding how your emotions are generated and processed and why you do what you do. So I just want to stress that the point is there's always something to gain from furthering our understanding of the human mind and even ostensibly unserious topics like horror can teach us so much not only about society but also ourselves. So I sincerely hope you've paid attention and learned something new but not only just that, something new about yourself. But with that out of the way, because my main product for this project was a short film, we're all going to have to get up and go downstairs to the district room uh, for a more theater-like setting. There will also be some popcorn down there, which you can grab before taking your seat. So without further ado, you can all follow me. Follow her. Follow her. was a big challenge to make a nearly 20 minute short film in that amount of time. But in the end, the process can be broken down into about four main components. Brainstorming plus writing, casting plus location arrangement, filming, and editing. But before I get into that, I'd first like to share that around the time I started working on this product, I was introduced to my sister's friend, Jordan Rousseau, who owns a small amateur film production company. And thanks to the support of the school, my family, and my own money, I was able to contract um, with the company by pooling funds together. I was really excited to do this since I felt that it would help unlock more opportunities for the product and help supplement areas of the production process where I would have been lacking the required skills. For example, negotiating film location permits and other such things that are out of my wheelhouse. But moving on, the first main component of production was brainstorming and writing. When I was working on the plot and writing the screenplay, one of the things I was most concerned about was writing a doable script. Every single aspect of the screenplay was in one way or another molded into what I believed would be most feasible. Uh, for example, the setting had to be public or common spaces, such as um, a, a forest or park, because other settings like on a cliffside, a plane, a public building, etc., could not be used or recreated. 
Another aspect I had to keep feasible was characters. I knew I wanted to limit my use of additional characters and just have two primary actors, one for the main character and one for the antagonist. This was because it's very challenging to coordinate the schedules of several people at once, which would make determining a filming schedule borderline impossible within my strict time frame. And some final considerations I had to make were ensuring I wasn't writing anything that would require advanced editing, as well as making sure I didn't make the script too long. In the end, the story I came up with follows the main character, Dana, who, as you may or may not have noticed, is a history major. The reason I chose to write her as such is because of the Woodrow's antagonist. The Woodrow's is inspired by a real European pagan tradition most commonly referred to as a wilder man. The wilder man, or wild man, is a practice in which people completely cover themselves in very animalistic cultural costumes and then embody a revered character or animal from their respective cultures. This practice is commonly performed to celebrate and promote fertility and uh, people's connection to nature. I was introduced to this tradition by my sister as she's very interested in history. And thanks to that, I was inspired by these cultural costumes to uh, make my antagonist resemble some such outfits purely for aesthetic reasons. So in order to include the Wilder Man, I had to find some way to establish it as something Dana would have been familiar with or studied at some point. And that's why I made her a history major. Now, in the film itself, the Wood Woes isn't actually real. Similar to the cake, which was a hunger hallucination, the Wood Woes is a hallucination caused by the drug Dana takes. Dana's heightened fear and paranoia gives rise to the Wood Woes, which serves as a manifestation of those emotions in the form of something she subconsciously fears. And finally, before I completely move on to casting and shooting locations, I'd like to mention a couple other small Easter eggs or deliberate choices I made while writing the story. For example, all of my characters, or the main characters, uh, Dana, Jules, and Marty, are named after the main characters uh, from the famous horror movie, The Cabin in the Woods. The reason I did that is honestly just because I felt like in a project about horror, my product should at least reference a couple famous horror films. And also I thought it'd be funny to name them after those characters since mine are also technically in a cabin in the woods. Another deliberate choice I made is that stereotypical tripping and falling scene when Dana is running from the wood boat. This was specifically inspired by the same kind of tripping scene in The Nightmare on Elm Street. Now, in the interest of saving time, I'll give just one last example of a small deliberate choice which is the cabin number. I don't know if anyone clocked it, but the place the characters broke into is cabin number 13. I did this as a reference to horror tropes in general, as the number 13 has historically been used in horror films to represent evil. For example, Friday the 13th, 13 ghosts, etc. Now that we've discussed that, let's move on to the next component of production. Casting and shooting location arrangement. This particular phase of production was a big challenge and very nearly tanked the whole product. This is because when we were working on casting people, the actress we had in mind for the lead role ended up not being able to join because she was going on a trip on the days that we had selected for filming. And aside from that role, we weren't able to find anyone to play the role of Jules yet either, so as the casting deadline approached, the stress mounted. But in the end, we were thankfully able to proceed thanks to two of my sister's friends, Meredith and Ella, who were both able to play these two integral roles. And honestly, it worked out even better to have the two of them together since Meredith and Ella are real life best friends, which helps to make their on-screen interactions less awkward. Another big challenge that we had during this phase of production was arranging filming locations. Originally, we were trying to get a permit to film in Hartman Creek, but after some correspondence with the people there, we were told that they wouldn't let us film there because of the prop gun used. And in addition to that, we learned that the daily permit price for filming there would be five times as much as we had expected, going from our initial $50 a day estimate to $250 a day. So we had to give up on filming there. Thankfully, in the end, we were able to figure out a solution and shoot all our, outside, our outdoor scenes in a wooded area near one of our crew members' homes and the indoor cabin scene was actually filmed in a cabin-themed room in the Norway production office. Now moving on to the third component of production, filming. 
We had only two days to film everything for this product, with no room for reshoots. On my own, this would have been a very big challenge, but with a great cast and crew, we were able to make it work. The crew consisted of Dimitri Lapkus, our sound guy, Narina De Silva, our camera person, and Jordan Rousseau, who helped with directing things. On the first day of filming, we had to have all of the cast and crew present, which made day one the most challenging. Thankfully, almost all of the cast made it, and we were able to film all the scenes we had scheduled for that day. In comparison, day two was a bit more relaxed, since we only needed two actors present compared to the previous 10. And I'd say this day was pretty fun, with the exception that it was super cold. Now, normally this wouldn't have been a huge issue, but this was the day we were filming the Lake Browning scene. <coughs> Uh, which essentially meant that we were going to have to put Meredith, our lead actress, through what was essentially a polar plunge challenge. <laughs> and we couldn't do any redos of this scene either, since her and her clothes would obviously be soaking wet. This uh, aspect of filming was actually a big concern for all of us. We really wanted to make sure that Meredith was safe and comfortable with filming that scene. But thankfully, Meredith was a trooper and was completely down for the drowning scene. And also, since we were filming near a crew member's home, they let us immediately take her inside for a warm shower and fresh change of clothes. Okay. Now the fourth and final uh, component of production was editing. I'm going to refrain from going uh, super in depth on this subject, but I will say that out of all the previous aspects of production, this was definitely the most stressful by far. Not only did we have an extremely strict deadline, but in addition to that, there were some challenges with the production company and myself. I'm guessing that because they had never worked with a student or particularly a VNS student before, and despite the fact that we had discussed it prior, I don't think they actually realized how closely I was planning on controlling and being a part of the editing process. But in the end, we were able to compromise on a process which would work for us both. We communicated primarily through emails, which I'll show content examples of on screen, now these are too long to be eligible, uh, sorry, legible on a slideshow, so it's just to exhibit, not to read. But anyway, in these emails, I would go through drafts of different scenes and write um, editing notes second by second. I also wrote additional instructions for things like special effects and music with specific examples or links to precisely what to use and where. And finally, before I finish talking about the product, I want to share a little bit about what, in my opinion, was the best part of the entire short film. This aspect was music. By far, the highest quality part of the product is the music. The sound effects and background music took hours to carefully choose and dictate when and where they should be used. But thankfully, my mom, who's a professional musician, was able to be of great assistance with this particular aspect of editing. But in addition to that, you may have noticed that we actually had a song with singing used at several points throughout the film. When I first started working on the product, I learned it would be really unlikely for me to be able to use music with any singing because of challenges acquiring permits. But after some discussion, my sister showed me a very old folk song which would work well and wouldn't be copyrightable as long as we recorded a custom rendition of it. This resulted in one of the highest quality aspects of the film thanks to my mom's friend and fellow musician, Nancy Capham, who's here tonight, she's right there. <laughs> um, Nancy sang the song, played the cello, and amazingly took much care into practicing and learning the pronunciation of the lyrics. In addition to Nancy, her husband and my uncle also sang parts, and one of Nancy's friends, who's an audio engineer, was kind enough to help out by editing and recording the music. Now finally, to finish up my presentation, I'd like to quickly mention my live experiences and sources for this project. This project had a total of four live sources and two live experiences. I was lucky enough to have personal interviews with many incredible and interesting people, such as Matt Mars, the owner of Burial Chamber, uh, Nancy Wall, the Lawrence University Associate Provost and Biology Expert, Doug Ronning, a licensed therapist and expert on Corey's unique place and culture, as well as Jordan Rousseau, the owner of Narrowway Entertainment, whom I worked closely with for two and a half months during production. My two live experiences including helping to construct a massive snake guts tunnel at Burial Chamber, um, as well as attending the Wyoiga International Film Festival's Psycho Night, which is a day of their festival dedicated to horror short films. And lastly, I would like to give a special thanks to all the great people who have supported me in this project, 
including my sister, my mom, my dad, my brother, my best friend Sim, Mrs. Luke, my advisor, my life sources, the casting crew for my short film, and all additional supporters. Without the help of all these people, I would not have been able to complete this project.
the layers of hell unintentionally. Um, but I thought that was really interesting. Another obvious one is Blair Witch. That's another found footage. Um, can't think of others off the top of my head, but there's definitely a ton. Hidden? Hidden gems for movies. <laughs> Hidden gems for movies. Oh my gosh, I really should have like tried to remember them before I did this presentation. Once again, honestly, Creep 1 and Creep 2 are kind of hidden gems. I mean, they're on Netflix, so they're not that unpopular, but I don't hear people talk about it that much. But, um, yeah. I'll, I'll look at you again in a minute. Um, what are your opinions on the Scooby-Doo movie? Those are very scary. Okay. Okay, what's my opinion on Scooby-Doo? So glad you asked this. Um, I didn't mention this. Scooby-Doo was my, like, favorite, favorite cartoon growing up. I, genuinely, I was Scooby-Doo for, like, three years in a row for Halloween. I think I literally had a Scooby-Doo costume. So, yeah. Um, did you say movie or just Scooby-Doo in general? Like, movie. Oh, not not a fan of the like live action ones, but I always watched the like the old cartoons of Scooby Doo. Like, I can't remember like their exact names, but I can very much remember their uh, theme songs. Like, I don't want to sing it because I'm not a good singer. But... Uh, my one. What is one takeaway that you got from this academic or this person? One takeaway I got from the. Like from the entire project, like one oh. takeaway that you got from this, like um, when you've realized about yourself or about the process. Or so we asked, like, what's one thing that I took away from my project? Um, I'd say one of the main things that uh, pushed me to do my project on horror and specifically make such a large part of it about the psychology of horror fans is not only that I like to understand the behavior of other people, but sometimes I just like to understand why I do certain things. And as a avid horror fan, I just, when people would ask, like, why do you like horror so much? I could not really answer. I was like, I don't know, I think it's fun and cool, um, but that's not really a great answer. So if you were to ask me that now, I think I would say that I am a person with very high morbid curiosity. Um, and that's at least one of the aspects that um, has made me a big horror fan. Yes. Um, if you get one actor, like, that could be in your movie, who would you choose to be in your movie and why? Okay, um, if I could pick like any actor to be in my short film, who would it be? Oh, I can't remember her name, but she's very famous. So, the lead actress in uh, Midsummer. You guys know her name? Florence Pugh. Florence Pugh! Whoever said that, yes, yeah, so correct. Um, okay, yep. <laughs> Are there any scenes you cut from your final short film? Oh my god, so many things got cut. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the question was, are there any things that got like cut out of the horror film? And absolutely yes, a lot of things got cut. Um, editing was a real interesting time for this product. Um, I'd say one of the, the biggest thing that got cut out is that if you recall when Dana pushes the Woodwose into like the lake or whatever, or attempts to do that, um, that was not originally supposed to be what happens then. Um, originally I was going to have them be like in some, they are in like a park here, but I was going to have them like come across some public bathroom and Dana was going to hide in one of the stalls and then the woodwose would come in and you would like see part of it through the stall and then it would like slam open one of the wrong doors and she would take that as an opportunity to like bolt. Um, but once again, Hartman Creek did not work out, and they did not want us to do that. So um, we had to just like scrap that. Um, and also, Jordan Rousseau, who I was working with, the owner of Narraway Entertainment, um, is not a fan of like what she called guerrilla filming, which is like where you, um, like if you think guerrilla warfare, it's like guerrilla filming, <laughs> uh, where you just like kind of go wherever, at, like if you just went to a random public restroom and filmed that. Um, without a permit or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, inspiration, like, for the plot, or like, what was your inspiration or whatever? Um, so my inspiration for the plot of the short film, 
was the quote at the end, which is something I came across during my research. I just thought it was interesting. I was like, yeah, uh, like endless hunger, that sounds horrible. Um, or like things like that, um, like if your fear was heightened to like an extreme degree. Um, I thought that that would be a pretty good basis for a short horror film. And um, despite how it may have turned out, it's not an anti-drug like short film. Um, it just uh, ended up being the best way to make that happen as something that occurs in the film. So. Yes? Advice for future seniors. Advice for future seniors. Oh, um, hmm. Ooh. I mean, the basic one is just log. I always have an issue with logging, so, yep. Yes? What's the difference between horror and terror? The difference between horror and terror? Uh, can I say that louder? Everyone heard that? Okay, whatever. Horror, um, technically, I believe the word uh, derives from the Greek word, um, that means like to shiver or to like, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's like to shiver or to like recoil from something. Um, and so I guess horror now is just synonymous with the genre and terror is just more like if you were to say fear. So you would never say like horror and fear are the same thing. But um, I mean, I guess you could say like you're horrified. So I don't really have a good answer to that question. Um, I'd have to think about that a bit more. How much time was like the original footage and then you edited it down to 20 minutes? Um, that's hard to say because um, when working on editing, uh, we would get drafts of different scenes so they wouldn't be all one thing. Okay. It wouldn't be like one entire draft that you're editing. You would get like scenes one through four or four through six or something like that and then you would send emails about it. But I would say Definitely longer than now. Um, probably the current the current film the content part of it is about fifteen minutes, so I'd say that it was closer to like twenty five or thirty. So maybe more or less. I don't know. Yes. Which Blair Blair Witch movie do you like better? Um, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Which Blair Witch movie did you like better? Which Blair, which movie did I like better? I have only seen the first one, so I'm a big fan. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I would just say the first one. Um, yeah. Um, I can't tell you because that's right by our crew home, and they said not to share their home location, so I will not. Be You'd say what city? City? Yeah. Um, isn't it still in Appleton or? Oh, I think you're right. I don't know places. It was in Martinsville, I guess. Um, so, yeah. Is horror an aspect of all cultures? Yes. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I, I always forget to say the question. The question was, is horror an aspect of all cultures? And during my research on the history and evolution of horror, I found that it's basically been a thing since forever. Um, maybe not in the traditional sense where we think of like horror movies and horror novels or whatever, but in the sense that people have always made it like tense or exciting or maybe even frightening uh, uh, content, I guess. So for example, um, one that I had heard was like the Babylonian Gil Gilgamesh could be considered basically horror. Um, one of the one of the weirder examples I had read was someone said that arguably um, cave drawings of like fights with big animals could be considered almost horror, like the, the prehistoric version or whatever. But um, I don't know, I would say that it's something that's been in all cultures um, from the dawn of time. Mm -hmm. which ones do I think are most accurate and least accurate. So all of the ones that are in the second half 
of that uh, section. So that'd be like sensation seeking, morbid curiosity. Um, others <laughs> um, would be really accurate ones in my opinion. Um, some of the less accurate ones, I didn't cover many criticisms of some of the ones I went over in the overview. But for example, the first one that I mentioned, excitation transfer. So in that theory, um, Zillman believed that uh, the horror had to end positively. So if there was a positive resolution, then your emotions would be transformed into a good, like, good emotions. Um, but this obviously does not work for all horror movies. There are plenty of horror stories, games, etc., that um, end poorly for the main characters or don't have um, positive endings. And so it just does not work. So, yeah, that one, probably. Favorite horror games? Favorite horror games. Uh, I'll say that louder. The question was favorite horror games. Um, I play a weird subgenre of video games mostly, so I only really like, uh, like, kind of like horror puzzle platformers, but they, but with interesting art styles. So, for example, if any of you know the game Inside, which is, uh, or the game Little Nightmares One and Two, I love those. Um, and then I know there's others, but off the top of my head, I'm having a Hard time apart from his quote, he suddenly includes the notion that this is the media that like influenced it on the Were there any pieces of media that influence the short film on a creative level? Um, I'd say yes, but it's hard for me to answer because I think that it's probably more of like a subconscious influence. Like I've watched so many uh, horror movies and consumed so much other kinds of like horror content that um, I think all of those have in one way or another influenced it. I did just remember, however, that the dirt eating scene, which is what that cake part is, um, that was supposed to be dirt actually. Um, that was inspired by a horror novel I read called The Troop, which if I had to boil it down to the uh, most accurate but also kind of silly uh, summary, it's about a troop of Boy Scouts who get stranded on a island. Uh, it's only like six of them or something like that. And um, there are weaponized super tapeworms from the government that they were like testing on someone and the guy that they were testing, they like, I think released him to go to that island basically to see what it would do to people. Like they were trying to experiment to see what it would do to people. And the reason I like that book actually is, again, morbid curiosity because honestly, uh, it's got really, really graphic, disturbing, disturbing descriptions of, uh, I don't even know what you would call it, like extreme, bodily consequences of super tapeworms. Like, it's really bad. Like, uh, I'll give one example just to let you know what the severity is. So one of the boys, um, he gets like so gnarly at the end that he, he had braces and um, all of his teeth uh, like kind of fell out except for one that was held in by like one gum. Um, and, but then, <laughs> It was still all in his mouth, connected by the braces. So it was just like something in there. And then he was like crawling upstairs after like once they try to like eat each other now. But he's like crawling up the stairs after somebody, and his teeth like all of them then fall out, and they describe it as like a teeth bracelet. Like <laughs> it's so bad. Like it's, I can't even explain to you. I would have to read passages of it. It's really really graphic. But it was interesting when I liked it. <laughs> Anyways, yeah.